I think this is something that I'm going to do more often um, than not, because I might not be able to do this in the future. Um, it's 5 a.m. kind of ranting existentialist blog, and it's not that I'm depressed at 5 a.m., it's just I'm thinking about deep things and uh, things that will affect me and things that may have affected people already or maybe will affect them later. Um, that being said, most of these are going to be as they have been before, either inspirational or completely and totally insane. And, um, you know, <laughs> my life is, um, at this moment, stuck in a cubicle. I'm not talking about an office cubicle or anything like that. Um, I used to be stuck in a cubicle. Um, <laughs> I used to be very, very stuck in a cubicle to the point where I was taking pictures at work because I had no other time to do it. Uh, the ex existentialist like problems that I have at five in the morning are always about nothing and everything at the same time, and it's always ends up making me sound like Ian Crossland, which is not a bad thing. It's just a thing. You end up going off into tangents about the world and philosophy and the goodness of people. And what I'm thinking is, like, right now, I'm stuck. This is the longest time I've been unemployed. Um, I mean, I had a uh, an interview, but a dinner with my editor today because I'm a freelance journalist freelance photographer, things that I do to make a little bit of income, not enough to live, or not enough to live on. Uh, a long time ago, I figured out that to make myself happy, to make myself truly happy, I have to be happy. And uh, one of the things that my parents and a lot of people will try to do is always go for money. And I'm not saying that money is not important. I'm not saying money is not everything. It's not. Um, the love of a cake, the love of cats, the love of parents, the love of family, the, the, the happiness that can't be described in any other way. You know, there are things that fill your life, and money for me is not one of those things that fulfill my life. Um, I think America would be a better place if uh, more people had less and uh, the rich people were, there were not as many rich people as there are poor people. Uh, there have been studies and there have been things to be said about places like Denmark, which taxes horribly their people, but they tend to be the happiest because they have the most income equity and these are people that are not necessarily poor. These are not necessarily people who are living paycheck to paycheck. These are people who are secure in their life because they have health insurance or health care. Um, their, their university is paid for as long as you are an average student. Um, if you want to go somewhere else, you can always afford to go somewhere else if you would like. And they, they have the lowest amount of rich to poor people ratio. They're, they're pretty even. And they tend to be usually the happiest people in Europe. And people will say, you know, oh, they don't smile and da-da-da, and this is socialism and da-da-da. But uh, why are they so happy? What, what are they doing? And me being stuck right now uh, gives me a chance to think, about all of this because if if I really wanted to I uh, could go to a congressional office of any Democrat and say I would like a job and if there was the space and the time for it I would do it um, because I helped run a political campaign lots of them and um, if I wanted I could go become a lobbyist again but those people are the most crooked people I've ever met, ever. <laughs> and that's saying something, because I've met some pretty evil people, but 
lobbying to me is just like a pretty evil kind of a way to make a living. Some living, I guess. And that's my biggest thing. If if I'm to make a living, I want to be happy. I don't want to necessarily be rich. I just want to be able to do what I like to do, which is not much by any standard. I like to have some electronics, like my camera or my, my laptop. I like to be mobile. I'd like to travel. And I'm not going to say travel like a lot and a lot. I'd like to take a big trip once a year to Las Vegas, to New York, to Mexico, wherever. And I want to take pictures of that place. And I just want to be happy. Now, people will say that this is an existentialist argument, and people will never watch this because it's going to be about 10 minutes, 20 minutes long. But I want to do what makes me happy. That is volunteer work makes me happy, but it doesn't pay anything because it's volunteer work. And it is, um, you know, <laughs> the love of a good pretzel or the love of a good person. I'd like not to be sick anymore because I've been sick far too often, far too much. Um, and I'd like to know my parents, my relatives better. Because right now we have a pretty strained and horrible relationship. My mom thinks that I don't want to help my family at all. My dad, I'm not sure what he thinks. They both know that they have a gay son. But like everything that I've done in my life, they don't seem to respond to anything. Except for if I have to pay a bill. Or... I mean, they didn't seem to respond to anything that I did. I've done many multiple things that could make someone proud, and I'm not sure, and I don't know if they're proud of me or not. I, <laughs> in high school, was able to play Flight of the Bumblebee on tuba as a uh, audition piece to get to Juilliard, and I got accepted, but I didn't go. Which, thinking about it now, I think that the fulfillment in my life would have been a little better if I had went there instead of to community college in UC Davis. Um, I could have had a very, very lucrative lobbying position, but like I said earlier, they are the most crooked things and people that I have ever met. In fact, I did my master's thesis on this, comparing lobbying to legalize corruption. I feel that strongly about it. And there's lots and lots of ways to show that that actually is the case. And that's why our political system in the United States is messed up. And I, I, I would like to have a better relationship with my family, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. Because my ideals are not the same ideals as my parents. My parents grew up in abject poverty. My mom would tell us stories about how they used to live in the marketplace in the Philippines and um, how hard it was, how spoiled her brothers and sisters are because they did not know, she's the oldest, they did not know what it was to live on rice porridge and things like that and um, thankfully or not thankfully I, I've volunteered at um at homeless shelters where i got a horrible staph infection and i stopped volunteering at, at homeless shelters i've been to mexico where kids are starving on the street um and i've been to places that most americans would never consider going and never consider helping these people and that makes me happy but knowing that my parents hadn't gone through that I know that their ideals are, as long as there's food on the table, as long as there's money there, as long as your well-being physically was okay, which it was when I was growing up, I grew up here, uh, a pretty nice McMansion-y house in the suburbs of Los Angeles, uh, quiet, safe, boring, and Knowing that 
they knew that we were okay. They, they, it, it hit other underlying problems, drug abuse, alcohol, uh, marijuana, things like that. Um, I mean, there's even a movie about it, about how Asian kids in the suburbs are getting into trouble because they just don't have anything to do. And that was the case, and that probably still is the case here in the suburbs, the safe, in, in our case, very Asian suburbs of Los Angeles. And it just, it's an under, it, there was an underlying problem there. And it would, it seemed to be multiplied because there are so many Asians out there that were career oriented and were not necessarily oriented on, on their children. In fact, to the point where there's some kids who were here and their parents were somewhere else making money and they, the absentee parents across the street, there's a kid who pretty much took care of himself and his cousins took care of him because his parents were back in Korea and China. And I find that disturbing. And people are always say, or maybe the conservatives always say that um, America is, is falling apart, family is falling apart. And the reason that family is falling apart is because of things like this. It's not that my parents were bad parents. It's just that they were not they, they were concerned about something else because they had something worse, way worse and way more horrible than what you would ever imagine. If you go to the Philippines or if you go to any country that is developing or even countries that are developed already, like um, Korea and the, the Philippines, especially in the tropics, um, you know, they're, they're, the, the poverty there is, is amazing. You cannot describe it to anything, any modern industrial city, you cannot describe it. You'd have to go to someplace like South Africa. And you'd see that these buildings were made of like cardboard, partially. One whole wall is cardboard and the rest is tin of some kind. Bugs, everything gets in there and um, rain. When it rains, buildings collapse. And you just don't realize how good you have it to be dry to be not hungry. And I know what it is. I spent weeks wandering around in San Francisco and Los Angeles, uh, pretty much basically living a homeless life. And uh, it's not pretty. It's not decent. It's not anything that you would want to wish on your most horrible enemy. It's cold all the time you smell you can't go to the bathroom there's no water imagine that imagine if you went through a whole day and there was no water at all you couldn't even go pee or anything and you're always afraid of the police and you're paranoid because you're probably on some kind of substance which i was and again the absence of the parent because they were working trying to keep everything okay and again things were mostly okay but there's that hole there the, the hole of existence the, the hole of parenting and it's I mean it's a profound loss and it's something that you can talk about now because you're both adults but as a teenager and as as a, as a little kid when your family lets you down, you feel abandoned. You feel like you're not worth anything. And your parents are quick to remind you of, you know, you, who do you think you are and why are you acting this way? I'm providing for you physically, but not emotionally. <laughs> it's again, it's, not, it's nothing that I can teach them. It's nothing that I can tell them. Uh, there are things that my parents know that they've were incorrect in parenting and in things that they were doing and things that they were interacting with me. Uh, my mom apologizes every now and then and it feels, I'm bitter. I'm bitter about it because things could have been different. Things could have been spectacular. <laughs> I, I hated that a lot of my Filipino friends, a lot of my Asian friends have good 
connections with their family. And they take, they, they take that for granted. And you don't understand how hurtful and how horrible it is. Things are okay now, but it's still there. I'm bitter. I'm bitter about a lot of things. I'm jaded about a lot of things because of how this turned out. And again, I don't blame my parents. I just have it in that way that you have to talk to yourself and you have to listen to that voice, I guess it's conscience or, or whatnot, because they're your only parents. They did as best as they could and they did pretty good. I graduated from college, I almost got a master's degree, and I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm stuck here. Moving back to my parents' house is really, really demoralizing after being gone for years. Having friends who are more successful than you and can hold a job and <laughs> can write and do things is really demoralizing too. But again, I've done so many things to be proud of. I mean, I'll, I'll try to list all the things that I think I can say that I was proud of. I was a number one soloist on tuba in the year 1999. I, uh, I won a state competition in plant identification, ornamental horticulture. I was third in the state. Going for the next year in 2000, um, I quit the band to go to do ornamental horticulture. Well, it was after. And um, I got into Juilliard still. And I didn't do it by myself. I did it because of a, a teacher, Mr. DeLeo, who said, you have real potential there. And I sent it in and I got into every music school that I applied to. <laughs> but I didn't go. <laughs> and I didn't pursue it in college. And I sh probably should have. Because that was pretty good. That was pretty good. I mean, to get into Juilliard, you have to be pretty good. With the ornamental um, plant things, whatever, 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 uh, I went to the national competition. I actually got second. My team got fifth, but I got second in the nation, which I think is a pretty good accomplishment. I know more about plants than many, many people who would take this as a course in college. I could explain photosynthesis. I can do all of that and I could I did it when I was 17 and the, the big disappointment for those both of those things is that when I called my parents to tell them about it they're like yeah 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 we're busy go away <laughs> and I cried and I cried you realize that uh, people don't like you when you're complaining about your life and things like that and that's when I first got cancer. <laughs> I've had it a bunch of times now, and people know or don't know that I had cancer. And uh, <laughs> the chemotherapy is awful. The, the treatments and the constant poking of needles into you. And for the most part, I hid it from my parents because, I mean, I don't know how I hid it because they were the ones who had to pay for it eventually. Um, but I did because I was determined to finish college without that pain and, uh, with winning that national competition, I was able to get like $5,000 was enough to pay for community college. And then I, uh, paid my way through, through regular college. I went to UC Davis. And that is an accomplishment. Everyone in my family has a degree. My brother has an associate. My other brother has a bachelor's degree. I have a bachelor's degree and I almost have a master's degree. And maybe it's something because both my parents have degrees. But it's an accomplishment for me. <laughs> and I didn't want them to come to graduation. I didn't want to go to graduation. In fact, the only reason I went to graduation is because my grandfather said he wanted to go to my graduation. I think, I feel... I'm probably not right in saying that uh, the two people that 
I know could be proud of me were my mom's mom and dad. My uh, grandma died when I was 16 and uh, my grandpa had to unfortunately go through the grieving process of losing a partner twice. Once this year and once in 1996, the year of the great El Nino in Southern California. It rained every day for a hundred days, 101 days, and um, when we had to bury my grandma, she, it was raining, raining, and raining, and the day that it worked, it was raining at the funeral, we pushed the casket in, and when we went to the cemetery, it stopped for 45 minutes, enough for us to bury her, because a lot of people had to not be buried because it's just the hole would be full of water, and uh, we were able to bury my grandma that day, and um, she would have been proud of me graduating. My grandpa was very, very proud of me. And the fact that I painted my hat, or no, I put something around my, my the fringe of my cap. My grandpa was proud to see one of his grandsons go down the aisle, receive a degree, and I looked funny because they were videotaping me. And uh, that's not, not something that everything everyone does. In fact, they uh, one thing that I did that I, I, a lot of people can't say they did is I ran for class president, <laughs> AES president, uh, which is associated student president, or I was vice president, whatever. I got 10% of the vote, which is actually a big chunk considering 45,000 students or 30,000 students, something like that. And we got 10%. <laughs> Good third party run. <laughs> And uh, at my graduation, my grandpa was holding a sign <laughs> of me reading a book that my friend um, Vin, or maybe Sean, uh, took a picture of and blew it up for me and uh, did that for me. And it was, <laughs> I was happy, although I was drunk. So <laughs> um, after that, or during school, I ran. I was the uh, county organizer for the uh, Wesley Clark for president campaign in Yolo County in Sonoma County. <laughs> it was a bit of a lark and it was a bit of a joke, but I figured out what the actual process is to nominate someone for a national office. And it was interesting. Howard Dean was there, Dean the Scream, and we didn't know what was going to happen. We were idealistic and we were all political science students, but it was insane and it was crazy and it was great. And, um, you know, we didn't win. John Kerry went to win, but that was all right. And I, I swear that Bush was going to lose, but who knows. If you've gotten to this far into the video, then maybe you remember I keep jumping back and forth. And um, the delegate process in... Uh, the Democratic Party. I learned what they do. You go to a stupid room, and I did it twice. I did it twice. I did. I did the uh, when we knew that Barack Obama was going to get the nomination. I went to vote for someone to be a delegate at the the, the national convention, and I could have won. I was a super delegate. Well, like sort of super delegate, and I should have done it, but I didn't. And I did that twice. I did that twice. I was. Uh, I was the, uh, I guess, the moderator for the gay and lesbians for uh, uh, Bill Richardson and uh, in Los Angeles for Bill Richardson and things like that. Uh, so helping on national campaign and then eventually going to the Barack Obama campaign, helping them with statistics and, and voter turnout things, in, especially in Nevada and California because turnout was different and Nevada went to Obama. And, Mexico went to Obama and all these places that I helped with that. It was insane. And I feel proud of it. I'm not sure that my grandpa would feel proud of it, who's still alive, because uh, he doesn't understand the whole process. He knows how to vote and what a vote is, but that's all you're going to get from him because he doesn't know. And he, a lot of the times, unfortunately, can't read the ballot. Uh, if my aunt or uncle or my mom went with him and spoke to him, the Tagalog, told him 
what the rudimentary things were for propositions and stuff, then maybe he would understand, but who knows. Another thing, I'm not sure if I'm proud of it or not, but I was a intern slash lobbyist when I went to UC Davis. Um, I had to register, which is interesting. I had to register to be a lobbyist, both nationally and in the state capital. It's odd. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm proud of it. I was arrested during the uh, protest for the Iraq war in San Francisco. I sat on the street and they told us, you know, don't give them your real name. Don't bring your ID. Just bring money with you. And they did that. And I'm proud of that. <laughs> I'm really proud that I was able to do a act of political, what is it called? Social activism. What did Gandhi do? It's a uh, passive protest. It's not something that you can do every day. Something, something that you would want to do every day. Get arrested every day. And, um, that's something I'm proud of. Not necessarily something that my parents would be proud of, but yeah. And I've done lots of things that I'm not proud of. I mean, I've, I told you earlier. I'm proud of my volunteer work. I'm proud that I'm informed. I'm, prou I'm proud that there are all these things that I can say in my life that if I die per chance, say cancer, because I've had it many times, I would, and I'm not afraid of, of death when it comes to this, because I've done so many things in my life that I'm proud of, and so many things... You know, people have a bucket list of things that they have, and I already fulfilled my bucket list. Which leads me to believe either my bucket list was too easy or I'm an overachiever. Some people would say a little of both, but running a political campaign for a senator and a uh, presidential candidate is a pretty lofty goal, and I was able to do it. And I'm still lost. I'm still lost because I'm lost. I don't know where to go from here. You go from job to job and a lot of people, they say their job is not their identity, but there's so much to do out there, to do good. And I had a job that was a group that was uh, pretty big and helped a lot of people. A lot of people saw them as bad, but I was not ever one of them because I worked for AIDS Healthcare Foundation and I knew a lot of people who were in the, in the long run saved by them. And talking to the clients and talking to the people that they save, you know that even if you're just a crappy administrative assistant or the receptionist, you contributed to something bigger. You contributed to something that you could not possibly do by yourself. You contributed to something that saved people's lives and enabled people to live longer, better lives. And th these people have had AIDS longer than I have been living. I'm 27 years old, and some of these people have had AIDS since I was in diapers. And... I was so proud to work for that company, and then they let me go. <sighs> Makes you feel bad. And a lot of the things that you did were socially were at work, and then you realize, you know, not everything is work. At the end, I was so burned out. I was a lot of the times working from five in the morning until seven at night. I mean, not necessarily working throughout the whole time, but it would be like that. Things happen 24 hours a day because they're an international corporation or nonprofit. And um, made me feel lost. I'm not so lost anymore, but I'm lost knowing I don't know what to do next. I'm lost because 
I want to help so many people, but I don't have the resources to do it. Like I said in my last video, if I were to win money, lottery, I would pay off a lot of my friends' debts and things like that. My friend Angelica, I would help her dad and buy it or fix the house. I uh, would pay a bunch of my friends' student loans, my own too. I would pay off all the houses that my parents owe money on. Uh, and I want to start a community theater for the San Gabriel Valley, this part of the San Gabriel Valley, because there's not one here. And I want a venue where kids could, could throw concerts, and as bad or good as the, the concerts are, They'd be able to throw them because I had something like that. It was a coffee house next to the Fullerton train station. It became a bar. Before, on Saturdays and Sundays, you would go there and it, you would find the best bands, Sublime, no doubt, and the worst bands like the Fuller Town Hullers, which were screaming teenagers. <laughs> and sometimes we would get bored and it would be with my friend Harmony and we would make. Um, stupid songs out of their songs so like we were like singing penis happiness <laughs> silly silly but i want people to enjoy the arts and be as affected as me One of those things that would make me happy, but not necessarily happy, is a relationship. We've been in many. And uh, unfortunately, I've been in four where my partner has died. And every time it happens, I just want to, I don't know, end it all. The your world comes crashing down. <laughs> you don't know what to do. <laughs> and you don't know what to say. Then you feel helpless. It's like when I have cancer, I feel helpless. And I miss them all. And it's just like, it's like that same feeling that I get from my family. I'm alienated by them, I'm abandoned. One of those things that I wanted when I was a little kid was to be saved from abuse and things like that. And I never was. And I never will be. And I wish that if I could just get back one of them, I would be happier. And they all seem to die in car crashes, all of them, every single one. <laughs> I even switch religions for it, <laughs> for one. Seen as I was not an enthusiastic Catholic, I became an unenthusiastic Jew <sighs> through all the ceremonies and everything, just to please his grandma. And his family died in a car accident, and he died in a car accident. I should call her more, because she was she's one of those people who would be proud about the things that I do. She didn't care that we were gay, she just wanted us to be both Jewish. <laughs> She loved him, and that's the thing that's missing in my life. And I loved him too. And the few that got away, the one that ditched me because I got cancer, I loved him too. <laughs> I would have married him. We were gonna get married.
when you could get married. It's hard. It's hard to go through life and you don't realize how much you grow with all the horrible things that happen to you. Why your parents stop feeding you. Why people don't care if you get A's or B's or C's. As long as you're doing okay. It's the way it was in my family. But if I ever were to get famous or if I ever knew that I was going to die, because all those times that I had cancer, I never felt that I was going to die. I felt really bad. I never thought I was going to die. I never thought I was going to do a 40 minute video, but here we are at 35 minutes and I'm not going to cans over. Are you still watching me? Because I'm not sure if I would be watching me at this point. I realize that I've been blessed with great intelligence and whatever, whatever, whatever. If there are a few things that I would do to change myself, I'm not sure if I would. Pretty cute for an Asian guy. And I don't think I would meet the people that I've met if I wasn't a chubby Asian guy. Which tells me that I'm dating rice, rice queens who like chubby guys. Yeah. <sighs> what can I do to complete myself? What can I get, do to get myself unstuck from this? It makes me feel bad. It makes me feel nauseous. And everything that I do now seems to revolve around my computer, which is odd. And everything I do now makes me look orange. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I can change the color balance by putting white. No, I still look orange. Doesn't matter. Somehow I know that I'm going to be okay. But sometimes you want to give up. Sometimes you want to just let the things overwhelm you. You'd rather be happy. I'd rather be stable. I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be famous. I just need to be stable. And you talk to yourself at five in the morning and you think, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I making myself insane? Why am I not, why are the sleepy pills not working? Life as I know it is to live, to play instruments, to do what I know what I do, to know what I know what I'm gonna say, to deal with the people who tried to put me down. Life is a thing that you live, and it's a thing that you will always take with you, no matter what you can do. My mom once said to me, because she lived in a dictatorship, that the government can take everything from you except for what you know, what you learn. They cannot take that away from you. They can kill you, but someone else We'll learn that same thing. And I want it to be fair. I want everyone to have an education and I just want everything to be good. It doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be wonderful. It doesn't have to be exceptional. It just has to be okay. It's taken me a long time to be okay. I'm not okay at this point, but I want to be okay again. After all those days of toiling and toiling and toiling. You just hope that you're, everything's going to be okay. And it will be. Keep going on. 
So that's like 40 minutes now. I wonder if you listen to the whole thing of my rambling. And uh, if you do, good. If not, <laughs> huge. So it's right the tail's end. Watch. You know what's going to happen? This whole thing for 40 minutes of rant is not going to be might right. <laughs> Signing off. Bye-bye. Have a beautiful Friday.